uh, the governor's welcome. As is everybody that wants to talk about how to make the state better. It's a new era in Illinois politics right now, and I'm going to ask you to play nice. I think I have so far. Okay. I'm going to let's just invite and not remind him that he hasn't been on. Uh, okay. Yeah. At Cochran Show on Twitter, Facebook.com, Steve Cochran Show, uh, Steve Cochran on Instagram, and, uh, you know, Friendster and MySpace. you got to look that up. Uh, at 913, um, you, you know, I just met uh, Nick Kratzer, um, but I couldn't be more proud of him. So on behalf of uh, my friends Kevin and Sam and uh, Peggy and my brother Mickey, who's celebrating 15 years of sobriety, uh, Maureen, you're doing nice work. Four years sober. Coming up on four years. Uh, February 6th will be four. You'll never forget that day, will you? Never. Just like the day I shipped out the boot. Um, you you were injured originally where and how? So um, I, it was a training accident. Um, I wound up, we were doing a out in the field for an extensive period of time. Kind of freak accident. Rolled my ankle on a rock. Twisted my knee when I went down. Um, kind of tore everything. So had two surgeries while I was still in. Um, after I was med boarded out, I had another two. And I mean, from that first operation when they gave me the opiates, it was kind of it kind of grabbed a hold of me. The addiction's fairly fast, then, right? It was for me. How I bad mean, did it, it get? It started. Uh, I mean, always been into alcohol. You know, mm -hmm. used to do the light lighter stuff. But once drinking and high test painkillers generally not a great idea. It's it's not. But it's it was um, that was my life for the better part of ten years. Uh, how close did you come to die? I attempted suicide once and. Um, Right before I got clean, I overdosed, um, actually, in my dad's arms on his birthday. Wow. Um, so we... the, 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 the question, I know you know this, but for people listening, the questions aren't intended to be harsh. It's just people need to understand that you have to get to a position where you want to save your own life before you can do it. It's, that's, that couldn't be so tr you know, more true. Um, you know, it's, we can't keep sweeping this epidemic under the rug. We need to scream it from the rooftops. Uh, you're here with Dr. Caitlin Simpson, Director of Clinical Operations where? With Footprints to Recovery. And what is Footprints to Recovery? Lean into that microphone for me. What is Footprints to Recovery? Footprints to Recovery is a nationwide group of addiction treatment centers. We currently have five locations, a detox facility in Mesa, Arizona, and four outpatient facilities in Hamilton, New Jersey, Wayne, Pennsylvania, Centennial, Colorado, and Arlington Heights, Illinois. And one of the reasons you go around the country is not just to talk about those particular things, but to, and it's day after the election. Mm -hmm. uh, my word's not yours, to encourage the cowards that we have in Congress to stand up and fight this for what it is, uh, the, maybe the greatest scourge in this country, the, uh, of the opiates from. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And the stigma that still exists with regards to addiction is unbelievably prevalent. And that's one of the things that is one of the biggest barriers that we face in helping people access services. Well, that's interesting, too, because, Nick, you're a man's man. You're a United States Marine. Um, you find out that this thing's got power over you. Uh, I assume that's one of the reasons it took you longer to ask for help. It did. It was... Um, it was Honestly, when, when I was in the addiction, it, it that wasn't even a thought. It wasn't a. It wasn't a. Because even if it was bad, you probably thought you could beat it on your own, right? I did for a long time. You know, if I only had enough money, if I only had enough, you know, painkillers or alcohol, I'd be I'd be fine. And I just really never looked at the underlying issues. Um, we talked about the fact that you talked about taking your own life. Um, it, it's usually a long time before that. I think the average doctor, you can correct me on this, the average number of times an addict tries to recover, I believe, is seven before it clicks in, and that's the average. Uh, so early on, when you realize you were in trouble, I assume you went down that road a few times. I can I can fix this. I can do this. And a couple of days later, you're right back in. Oh, that, w without, without fail. It was, um, you know, substitution for a few days, try to get off the opiates, and then right back. You know, I could do it only on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as long as I don't do it every day. And and then Tuesday came around, and it's like, well, I could cheat a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Samber? With the addiction to the opioids, were you still in a lot of physical pain? I was, but it, it also enhanced that, that pain. So taking more opiates allowed me to do more activities, which caused me more pain. Okay. Uh, what is the high? Uh, you know, and I say this from, I'm king of the codependents. Uh, I mentioned my brother. I'm the guy that would give him money. I'm the guy that would, uh, you know, try to make sure he was alive and make him feel better. There's no win in that. That's not something to be a, as a badge of honor. You're making the problem worse. And it took me a long time to realize that. But having never been there, what is the high that kept you going back? Aside from the pain relief. At, at, at that point, it was the, it was the fear of getting sick. Um, you know, opiate withdrawal is, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. It's worst like, thing you ever went through. Worst thing I ever went through. 
Um, you know, it's it feels like the flu times a million and it's like you just can't focus and it's the only thing you can think about is getting more to feel normal it wasn't even about getting high anymore that's a testament to the power of the drug right because you know how bad that feels and you still end up going back that's the definition of insanity Mm -hmm. you know And, and that's what i was stuck in that's what you know everybody gets stuck in for whatever length of time that they're using for it's just that nothing matters You know, I used to steal from my sister and then help her look for it. You know, that's the type of person I was. You know, um, it just nothing else mattered except getting what I needed to get in order to function so that I can go and get more. Dr. Simpson, the pharmaceutical companies, Dr. Senator Durbin, I should say, was talking about this. Uh, The pharmaceutical companies are coming around to some extent. But and uh, listen, I take uh, prescription medication. Prescription Mm -hmm. meds are very important in the world. But the opiate abuse in this country can be largely uh, uh, followed. You can follow the money trail. Mm-hmm. So the, the pharmaceutical companies are stepping up to some extent, even if it's just a set of lawsuits to try to make their lives a little easier. What uh, sort of fight do we have to put on politically to help beat this back? I do think- we have the right people in office, for instance? I think there, it's a significant fight. You know, we need to make sure that people are prescribing appropriately and that the medications aren't being prescribed. There was a long time where the opiate prescriptions that were being prescribed was a cash business, and the Suboxone medications for medicated assistant treatment were a cash business, and that all needs to be regulated appropriately. So they put things like the prescription monitoring programs in place to be able to effectively monitor physicians that maybe weren't prescribing appropriately. Um, that all needs to be regulated. It needs to be appropriate, just like any other medication that is being prescribed. Well, you're a doctor. How much of this do you put on fellow doctors? I'm sorry, excuse me? I said you're a doctor. How much of this do you put on fellow doctors for making the problem worse? I, I think there's it's such a layered issue that part of it is the... A lot of blame to go around? There's a, there's a lot of things that went wrong, starting with the over-prescribing, starting with the way that, you know, people that are struggling with addictions have been perceived, even tracing to the legal system and putting people in jail for also struggling with an addiction and committing crimes like Nick was talking about. He was stealing from his sister. So we, a lot of, we see a lot of people making a lot of decisions in their active addiction that they would never make in, the, in sobriety. Um, so now a lot of the legal systems have shifted their perspective and are offering treatment and are supporting those and being able to get well and are court mandating people to go seek help and get treatment. Um, but there's so many things that need to shift, starting with the stigma, starting with the perception of what addiction is and really giving good access to care. Uh, from what I understand, what we know about alcohol addiction in particular is some of us are more predisposed than others mm-hmm. uh, because our brains are wired differently. Uh, opioids the same way or are opioids are powerful? They'll just override that. I think any addiction in general. Okay. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean those of us who aren't wired for it can't get into a huge problem. Everybody can get into it. Okay. At this point, overdose-related deaths is the leading cause of death in the U.S. for people under the age of 50. Um, so we were just talking about that earlier. Think about that. You have more of a chance of possibly dying from an overdose than being hit by a vehicle. It's amazing. It's amazing. Samer. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Nick, was when you were in the opioid, uh, in the addiction phase early on, did that any of that have to do with the fact that you were no longer in the Marines, you know, doing that because you couldn't physically. So was there an escape portion of that? There was a lot of, you know, feelings and emotions that I tried to suppress. Um, You know, I I felt like I wasn't able to fulfill my duty, um, you know, for a long time. Like I let my brothers down. um, And I know, you know, after doing a lot of work on myself that there was really nothing I could do. It was out of my control. But somewhere in the back of my mind it was that guilt piece you know I let down my father who's a marine and you know uncles and it's like a family business you know so it was like here I am and I I couldn't I couldn't do my job so let me get high you weren't holding up your end of the bargain it's important to that you share your story and that a lot of people share their stories you know just in the last two weeks we've had uh, two young people we knew that died who had issues with uh, substance abuse and they're all people that when you look at them you think that person's not addicted to anything or they don't have any mental issues no you know, 25, nick is and, a, uh, 25 and under dry yeah, come on i know but nick is a totally fit you yeah. know nice looking like, handsome devil right well now now i entered i entered treatment well don't get cocky you're not at 100 <laughs> at 115 pounds you know right? and that's where it mm-hmm. took me i couldn't care i could care less about my looks what i was wearing my head you know shaved hair because it was easier and it didn't cost me any money right because all i was focused on was getting more. that was your entire day 
Um, I think the average people that we see coming into treatment are in between the ages of 18 to 26 or 27 years old. Um, the age of onset is specific to opiate use is so much younger these days, and our young generations coming up are so desensitized to what opiate addiction is because it's the kid on the football field, mm -hmm. or it's their friend next door, or it's Johnny's mommy across the street Everybody that started knows popping pills. Yeah. It's not that person that you know you used to see homeless on the corner anymore. It's it's your neighbor. It's everybody. So it's unbelievably prevalent. Uh, stick around. A couple more questions for you. And uh, for people that want more information on uh, what you guys do from a clinical basis every day in Arlington Heights or wherever they're listening around the country, what's the website you send them to? Footprints2Recovery.com. Footprints2Recovery. T-O? T-O. Footprints2Recovery.com. Back to the Steve Cochran Show. Well, we got a couple more minutes with our guests here. We're talking about the scourge of opioid addictions in this country. And, 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 you know, in addition, resources for you and where to get help. Dr. Caitlin Simpson is Director of Clinical Operations at footprints to recoverycom What do you say to parents or grandparents or husbands or wives or girlfriends and boyfriends who know they love somebody in trouble and they don't know what to do? I think the first thing to do is to educate yourself and understand the resources around you. That's one of the biggest barriers we see to treatment is that when someone is ready for help, that window of opportunity to engage people in treatment is so small. So if your loved one comes to you and says, I'm ready, I want to go for help, and you don't know where to call, you might have just lost your opportunity to get that person into treatment. So to educate yourself about your resources and where you can send your loved one. It's very important. It's crucial. Yeah. What about the denial of, of uh, parents and grandparents? parents and spouses and things about the addiction. the codependence well yeah yeah codependent but you probably sense that your brother had a problem you know it's funny yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can you can know it for years you can know that your loved one has a problem and you still can't fix it why no. not saying you can fix it but recognizing you think you can. Mm -hmm. oh i see you thought you could take care oh, of it. yeah oh. i fix everything why couldn't i fix this mm -hmm. or like my family you know just kind of if we don't add fuel to the fire maybe it'll just work out on itself or right. not my son you know he's he can't be that bad he's mm -hmm. not like johnny from down the block meanwhile mm -hmm. you know that's an important piece of that because there there is a, a, a thing where you have to admit on some level that you didn't fail um and you didn't miss it um and now you got to do the right thing to get to it because and again this is a male thing too i'm not saying women don't feel this way but we feel we can fix everything especially our kid you know, it's had, had to you be can't brutal. tell me. I'll figure it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why I, did this work for you? I can't do it without without the support that I've had. You know. Uh, but there's a lot of programs out there. Was there something about this that was different? It is. You know, for me, it was it was that whole incorporating the life the life skills. You know, because at the end of my road, there were bank accounts that were overdrawn. I didn't know how to write a check. I had forgotten healthy eating habits, you know, how important working out and, and creating those natural endorphins were. So to have someone that I could talk to, have the, you know, the clinical team that can help me with all of my inside issues, you know, the self-hatred, the, mm -hmm. you know, the PTSD, the trauma, but then also let me know that it's not okay to live on Red Bull and cigarettes. Like we need to actually teach you how to do these basic life skills that we forget. You know, because we're we're trying so, to take care of yourself exactly. in a healthy way. Uh, you're a great spokesman uh, for um, um, uh, for sobriety, and uh, you ought to be proud of yourself, man. Thank you. I, you know, honestly, I just the only thing that I would love to see out of this is it help one person because right. that one person can then send that ripple effect, and it's just creating change. Like the awareness is so important. You know, me speaking out, and I don't have. You know, I don't believe in that anonymity for myself. Like, I, I tell my story wherever I go. Tell your truth. Because it could help that next person. Uh, what do you do now uh, when you're not doing this? When I'm not doing... Uh, to talking about how to help folks. Uh, I, I actually talk about it all day. So I, I work at Footprints. So this is the gig. This is the gig. That's paying it forward. It is. How you about know? your relationship with your family? It's so much better today. Like, you know, at one point, they did, really didn't want anything to do with me. Right. And, um, like... My brother got married, he had kids, and I'm involved in their life. And for me, that's the ultimate high. Sure. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Doc, your website again, whether it's Arlington Heights or wherever, where you send folks? It is footprintstorecovery.com. And there's other resources there as well, I noticed, too. Absolutely. So you can make yourself knowledgeable, or mm -hmm. if you feel like you're in trouble, get there now. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you coming in. Safe Thank travels. you. And keep up the good work, Maureen. Simplify. There you go. Nine